This is the Nobel Podcast, where we talk about how to optimize your technology, life, and mind. We're joined by special operations veterans, entrepreneurs, investors, and others who have overcome difficulty to make it to the top of their craft by staying in the fight. All right, Jeff, welcome to the Nobel Podcast. Really appreciate it, man. Glad to be here, buddy. So I think we'll start off with, with good old Pennsylvania. I had the, the pleasure of seeing your hometown in PA at one point. I can only describe it as backwards. I think PA has the highest number of SEALs per capita than any state in the union. Do you have an idea as to why that might be growing up in PA? Outside of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, there's nothing. So I feel like you kind of got the, the small town, at least in my hometown, is like really big on patriotism and giving back to your country. And I, I don't know. I just feel like there's a lot of that going on in, in PA. You get into trouble when you're a kid quite a bit? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I got, got in trouble quite a bit. And when I finally decided to join the Navy, it was kind of a relief probably for my folks, you know? So well, what does trouble look like in cow country? Me and my buddies were real, like on the weekends, we always would go out to a cornfield or out in the woods somewhere and make a big bonfire and get a few cases of beer and smoke a little weed and stuff. That was the trouble we were getting to run around drinking and smoking and kind of raising hell and out in the middle of nowhere. So yeah, that's like the innocent PA raising trouble. Not not that big of a deal at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We met in 2007. We went through boot camp together, went through buds together. We checked into the teams together. We did a tour together in the same platoon. I know you really well, but I actually don't know why you joined the Navy. I don't know what made you want to become a SEAL. So like, what what, what was that? What was the moment in your childhood when you realized that? Senior year of high school, you know, like me and all my buddies were trying to figure out what we wanted to do when we grow up. And, you know, some of them wanted to go be I think one of them wanted to be a welder or a pipe fitter. Another one was going to school to be like a lawyer and thinking about careers from that, like a young boy thinking about what I wanted to spend the rest of my life doing terrified me completely. Like I, the thought of like being locked down to a career nine to five job was something that I wanted to avoid at all costs from a young age. I also really looked up to my grandfather who was a Korean war veteran, um, served in the Korean war got blown up by mortars and grenades and and I got banged up pretty good got awarded the purple heart and bronze star with valor so I like every time he would talk about the war I'd be right in front trying to soak up as much of that as possible and I looked up to him so kind of wanted to follow in his footsteps and the thing about when we were younger you know 9-11 happened Iraq kicked off and then shortly after that Afghanistan kind of kicked off so there was wars to be fought and uh, I decided in high school there that that's what the route I was going to go. I was going to chase that. I wanted to take it to the show. I wanted to go to the fight. So I talked to my grandfather about it and he was like, go to the army special forces or Rangers or something like that. And so I actually talked to an army recruiter and tried to talk me into going into being infantry or going to be a mechanic for the first four years and like fuck old enough to go be, go to selection or whatever. And I didn't want to do that. Told my grandfather about that. He told me to, to go talk to the Navy about the UDTs because that might be the next best option. So I showed up to the recruiting office after <laughs> the, the UDT, so. Did you get to talk to your grandfather after you did a couple of deployments to the Middle East? No, he actually passed away when I was in SEER school. Oh, so okay. I would I would have loved to talk to him after my first deployment, you know, like experiencing that and being like, picking his brain and what like the differences were, similarities were and mindset and then even like transitioning and all that, how it was for a Korean vet versus, you know, someone in GY. Yep. Yep. That was a extraordinarily intense, intense war. I went, I could only imagine what we would have said about it, but you got to talk to him through buds. So, I mean, let's jump into buds. Did, did, did buds basic underwater demolition seal training? It's the selection process to become a seal. Did that live up to your expectations as you were a kid thinking about the seal teams? Was that what you thought it was going to be? Oh, yeah. And I was lucky that whenever I went to Buds, we had the documentaries all out. So you kind of knew what you were getting yourself into. So I think it was Buds 234 documentary was out. And I watched that several times before going to Buds. So I kind of when I got there, I knew exactly what to expect. And it was kind of cool, you know, watching that documentary. And then you find yourself right on the the, the grinder on day one of Indoc or first days of Buds. And it's kind of like a surreal feeling like, let's, let's get this thing on. But it was nothing short of a swift kick right in the nuts, man. That's <laughs> that's kind of how I describe buds, but no, no let off. Everybody has a 
part of buds that really got under their skin that was really hard for them what 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 was yours was it in first phase second phase third phase was it hell week was it the pool phase like what was it that really got you that made you think twice second phase kick was the hardest thing for me hands down I mean, I've, first phase was just a mental beat down. And I was, I guess I'm pretty good at just putting my mind down or head down and just keep moving forward. When you get in the second phase, you kind of have to add the whole diving aspect to everything. And there's a lot of people don't realize there's dive physics, there's studying. I mean, it's, there's some book work involved in that all while getting, getting your shit pushed in and getting, getting beat pretty good and, and being uncomfortable, wet and sandy all the time and still maintaining your four mile time run, your ocean swims, your courses and all the stuff to to make it through to the next phase and then on top of that you got your your pull comp your pull week or whatever and i remember hitting pull week i struggled with the water quite a bit i don't know if that's maybe because i was in, from pennsylvania and had very little i don't know i didn't have a whole lot of experience around the water so pull the water was definitely a little bit uncomfortable for me so we the biggest hurdle we hit was the tread the the tread i struggle with the tread and that's whenever you have your twin 80s on your back you have your dive belt are you wearing it or do you have are you holding it I no, you get your hands out of the water with the water below the wrist with, I think your dive belt's on with the twin 80s on your back. Right. And you tread, you tread water. I forget how long it is. Five minutes. Five minutes. Seems like an eternity. Yeah. But yeah, the first time I did it, I was kicking and I slowly, like my hands slowly just kept getting deeper underwater. Next <laughs> thing you know, I'm at the bottom of the pool looking up and then the tunnel vision comes and I wake up on the side of the pool getting slapped by the instructors. <laughs> So that was that was the start of the where things started getting serious for me, where I was like, OK, uh, I need to really start getting my focus in and working on this because I came too far to, to end a, a second phase. So every night when I got back from good done with the day, got back to my bed, I would practice breath holds in my my rack until I I would start off and I I would clock it whenever I felt myself breathing. The next day I would add five more seconds to it. There's been a couple of nights I would actually pass out from holding my breath too long, working on my breath hold in my rack. By the end of second phase, man, I had a, I had a solid breath hold and I was pretty comfortable in the water. But this first start of it was what definitely rocked my world. Well, I got to test how hardcore that is that you would you would hold your breath at night because I was a roommate and you never told me you were about to black out when you're holding your breath. So that's <laughs> next. Thing done. What was the internal discourse like under the water? Was it? Was it just a general discomfort of being underwater? Because you obviously weren't afraid to pass out. You weren't afraid to black out. What was it that you overcame? It was just kind of like overwhelming, maybe putting all the knowledge and the pieces together and actually do the thing versus just talk about it, you know? So, okay, let's say that was the worst part of Buds. What was the best part of Buds that you can remember? You'll probably remember this. Uh, second phase was also the best part of Buds because it was right around that time we kind of got our class motto to stick to the plan. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. So second phase for our class, we got our asses handed to us in second phase, like bad. It was, we got beat pretty bad in second phase to the point that it was starting to get annoying. And it was around this time, it was like within the first week that we all kind of like banded together. And we're like, you know what? At the end of the day, these instructors are going home to their wives or going to the bar or whatever. And we're, we're going back to, to bed. So this is all going to end eventually we can get her ass beat longer than they can care. That's just what we'll do. We'll stick to the plan. Just keep getting her asses beat because eventually they're going to go home. So I, we were getting her asses beat after one of a PIBI that we did, room inspection. And we all just started to shout, stick to the plan, guys, stick to the plan. As we were out on the ground, on the ground, and we're doing push-ups and smurf jacks and all that. So it's kind of like our class model. That's also like the best part of Buds is when we came up with stick to the plan the big middle it, finger to the instructor. I genuinely believe them when they kept telling us we were the bur worst buds class in history. I actually thought that they were being sincere that I'm like, no, they were probably just pushing us to do exactly what you just said, actually unite and basically say, fuck you come together as a class. Yeah. I think it worked because we killed third phase. Yeah. Yeah. What were your specialties in the teams? I'm aware of JTAC. You want to dig into what JTAC is and whatever else you were specialized in? I leaned heavily into the engineering side of things, learn how to work on vehicles and do maintenance on generators and all that stuff because first deployment was vso and then when we got back from that first deployment into the the second platoon i got i got a got went to jtac and then went to advanced explosive techniques and so mm -hmm. for those of you been what jtac is it's uh um essentially the guy on the ground communicating with the aircraft that owns the battle space above them and uh, it's kind of like a glorified air traffic controller of the battle space calling in airstrikes if needed or or calling in 
medevacs or anything like that. So you're kind of controlling the airspace. I kind of feel like God on the battlefield because you're you're a guy with a radio able to control bombs, guns from multiple stacks of aircraft overhead onto enemy targets that you designate. I, I and you can see the whole person. picture from above. The entire picture. Where are the friendlies? Where are the enemies? It, it was, I, I genuinely enjoyed like the cognitive engagement. Yeah. Do you remember any particular moments of being a JTAC that you thought stood out that were like, this is, this is pretty cool? Yeah. There was times where I was like, this is pretty cool and this freaking sucks. There was a Romanian task force, but the Romanians never really wanted to do anything. So whenever they would get spun up, they would have an excuse why they wouldn't go out. So there was HVI rolling through. The Romanians didn't want to get it, but we were right next door. So they kind of gave us the, the package and we went out and hit it and, uh, we rolled in. It was night. So we kind of rolled in quick. As soon as we rolled in there, there was a big guy squirted out off the target. So there was probably, I think there were six dudes that all took off on motorcycles. And where we were at, there's a bunch of wadis or dried riverbeds. And they all drove into these dried riverbeds and wiped out. And the bikes wouldn't start again. So now it was a foot race. And so I was with the C2 element. And I could see like there was five guys foot racing these Afghans kind of running in sandals through the desert. And we had five five guys chasing after him. I remember looking back at, at my ground force commander and being like, looking at him, looking at the guys taking off on foot, looking at him like, sorry, man, I'm out. And I took off running with the guys and caught up with them. And just about the time I caught up with them, they turned around and just AK sprayed us with AKs. And it was like a cloud of dust just engulfed us. And once the cloud of dust disappeared, everyone realized that we were all okay. We took a, started running again. Right around that time, Marine Cobras checked in. And then we were like, okay, guys, let's hold up. And then the Cobras came in and cleaned up the situation for us. So that was like the highlight of the JTAC and my very last op as a team guy. The low point was, is actually, you were with the main element. We it was whenever you walked, whenever you guys walked into that ambush in the green zone. So second deployment, we were in a, a place called Zobel province and, and right along the Ar Argadog River, a place called Saigas. When we left our base, if we made a right, we were essentially getting in a gunfight every single time. And when we made that, we frequently made rights and we went up river to a place called Narays. And when we hit the Narays, we got ICOM chatter saying if just further back, they like was where we needed to go. Essentially, we were kind of working sources and picking up intel that if we go further down the river, that's where the Taliban would be. So we went and ended up walking into an ambush. And in that Pacific area, the river is very green and lush. And whenever guys get in that, if you're even on the high ground or, or aircraft overhead, you can't really make out where guys are. And I, I wasn't on the ground with you guys whenever you guys watched in that ambush. So I don't know how intense the fight, the fight actually was. Me, I was up on top of the mountain. So I got in there the night before with the overwatch element and set up. So I, whenever you guys were going through there, we had F-18s check in. And I couldn't tell exactly where you guys were, and I couldn't tell where the enemy was. And you guys are popping smokes. I couldn't see the smoke. Aircraft couldn't see the smoke. And then you made it very clear. I think it was you that was like, if you don't get rounds off that aircraft soon, we're going to die. And, that, and you were saying that they were within 100 yards of you guys. So I passed Danger Close, gave the, the GFC's initials, had them come in and just keep north of that east to west part of the river as soon as they came in and they went hot with the guns and everything went quiet there was no radio talk from you guys there was no gunfight it was like deafening how quiet it was and i actually almost like vomited because i thought I'd, i just dropped bombs on you guys and it was seemed like an eternity went by but eventually someone came in and was like fuck yeah <laughs> so yeah, once that kind of came in, I could finally take a breath again. But that was one of the worst parts about being a JTEC. You know, you have that, you you have such a responsibility. You can either be the hero or you can be the zero real quick. So from my perspective on the ground, the rounds are so close, they hit the trees over our head from the aircraft. That was incredible. Yeah. Like I'd never experienced anything like that in my life. That was the most intense aspect of my, my deployment as well. It was cool to hear from your perspective. And your first mission, the one with the Cobras, I was actually watching that from the talk, the Tactical Operations Center. I was watching the ISR footage and I was watching you run after the bad guys and I watched the gun runs come in. It was, it was, it was amusing. That's awesome. So you did the two, you did two deployments, right? Yeah, two deployments. 
two deployments. I think you did training after that. W what was the moment you realized you wanted to transition out of the military and, and why? So when, once we left Afghanistan, the kind of the writing was on the wall that 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 type of op was kind of going away. The 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 kinetic style of operations conducted in Afghanistan were, were essentially dying. And, you know, to be to be an active duty SEAL, it's a I mean, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of dedication. You're constantly on the road training and the thought of going through another workup to go to not go back and do that job wasn't worth the squeeze for me is kind of what I, I realized is like if there was still a war to be fought, sign me up. I do another one in a heartbeat. But that kind of going away, that mission going away was kind of what I signed up to do. And if it wasn't an option to do that anymore, then I was kind of looking for something new. OK, so w when you finally did it, I mean, I, I kind of touched on my transition when I was interviewed. It's a super important subject for anybody who goes from the military to out of the military. It is a radical culture shift. It's a radical shift in purpose. And then you have to redefine basically yourself away from being a member of a unit and identifying yourself as that unit versus identifying yourself as an individual human being. Can you, can you touch on what that was like, you know, physically, emotionally, psychologically? How did you handle that? I feel like the first year to three years are like, what I refer to as like the free days, like you're so free, you're, you're no longer attached to the military, but you're not really attached to anything else. So you can do whatever the heck you want to do whenever you want to do it. But those days end. And when they end, you realize that you're no longer part of it is what kind of happened, at least in my, my shoes. So yeah, when it first got out, I was chasing that freedom, loving it could do whatever the heck I wanted to do. But then that, that slowly fades away. And then whenever that fades away, you realize that you're off that train and that train's still going. And even though you might hang out with some of your buddies that are still in, you're not, you're no longer in, you know? So you kind of lose that and you miss that. But then you have to, like you said, you have to start developing who, who you actually are. Like you no longer, you lose that identity. You know, you, a lot of guys hang their whole identity on, on what they did or, or what they do. And you have to quickly realize that you're much more than that or you got to figure it out, you know? Yeah, I think a lot of SEALs, a lot of special forces, a lot of the guys in the combat units in general, I think they forget what it was that made them SEALs or, or combat vets in the first place. They kind of have to rediscover that on their own terms post-military. And in some ways, that's even harder than getting into the military because you're not doing it with that brotherhood, with that unit. So if you, if you had any advice for anybody who's going to be transitioning soon, what, what would you give them? Lean heavy on your family. If, you got, if you're lucky, fortunate enough to have family. Uh, I have an amazing wife. Without her, I'd be, I'd be a mess, but lean heavy on your family so if you got them definitely do that if you don't have family find a community find find a club a community something that you can you can get find people to grow with and get accountability from so a lot of people talk about dropping everything getting off the grid moving to the wildlands and living a life like yours so for those who don't know you're basically a professional dog musher right now you just got done doing the iditarod which we'll get into in a bit but I, you know when i came up to visit you you, were, you said you basically started off picking up dog crap and then eventually from there ended up having your own kennel, which you have now. That takes, you, you were a Navy SEAL, you're picking up dog crap. That takes an incredible amount of passion and humility to make that happen and then become the success story that it has. Can you give us the story from, from showing up in Alaska and just basically knocking on a door and saying, can I, can I work on your, your kennel? Dog mushing was an idea that I kind of put in motion in my final days while I was in the, in the teams, as I was transitioning out, kind of like a lost soul figuring out life, you know, you're trying to figure out who you actually are, what, what you want to do whenever you grow up, you know, you, you have to answer those questions all again when you get out. And I remember that conversation I had with my wife. My wife was like, what is it that you want to do? Like, it can be the most left out of pocket thing that you can think of. Just what, what is it that you want to do? And I was like, it'd be cool to move up to Alaska and get a bunch of dogs and run the identity rod and get in dog mushing. And then she said that as long if you can come up with a plan, we'll 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 see if we can do it. So that's all I really needed to hear. And then I started as soon as I heard that, I started sending emails out to other kennels and and dog mushers to ask them if they needed help or could use a hand helping out because I didn't know anything about dog mushing. Being born in Pennsylvania, we still we get snows and winters and stuff, but nothing like you get up in Alaska. And I never even harnessed a, a sled dog before, but. You know, I kind of, I love outdoors. I love dogs. I love hunting. I love fishing. I love camping. If you mix all those together, you kind of get dog mushing. So 
that's kind of what drew me into dog mushing. And I rescued a dog in Afghanistan and I had a super strong bond with that dog. He tragically passed away right as I was getting out of the Navy. He was hit by a car and, and was killed. And I knew that there was no way I would ever have a bond with a dog unless I did something challenging or something on the level of what combat would do. But then I read the book about the I did rod and like, unless I did that. So that's kind of how the whole thought process of why or how I wanted to get into dog mushroom came about. And I sent an email out to dog mushers, Ali Zirkel and Alan Moore, who live in two rivers, Alaska, just outside of Fairbanks. And they needed a hand for the following winter. So I kind of agreed to come up and work for them for free. And they were going to just kind of show me the ropes on how to, how to be a dog musher, what all that entails. And when I first showed up there, I think the first, the first week I just scoop poop, you know, kind of learning how like care for the dogs and, and care for the kennel. And then the next week I learned how to feed the dogs and, and then I learned how to harness the dogs. And then I was learning how to hook them up to the lines and how to set the lines up. And then I was jumping on the back of the four wheelers because we start off in fall before we got snow and the dogs run pulling the four wheelers around. And then eventually got to the point to where they trusted me enough to where I was running my own team with them. And, and that's kind of how it all started. And I learned everything I learned, like all the basics through them. And that following year, I ended up buying a place down the trail from them and, and uh, started my own kennel. Tell me about the kennel. How many dogs you got? What's a day in the life like running a, a dog mushing kennel? I have a total of 25 dogs. Out of the 25 dogs, only 18 of them are sled dogs. The rest are retirees and pets. So 18 of them are actually the athletes that that are pulling sleds down the trail and going for long runs. Day in the life, man, we wake up, we're kind of in between seasons now. The snow's all melted. We just got the sleds all put away. So we're we're transitioning into the summer months. And in the summer, what I do is I wake up, go out and pop off all their water buckets, make sure they have plenty of water, go through, scoop poop, and then I'll let the dogs run. So that's how the dogs need food, water, and exercise every day. So they get water in the morning. We'll exercise after that, let them run. So I have a big 100-yard by 50-yard enclosed area that I kind of let all the dogs loose. And they run around. I'll throw tennis balls, and they'll chase them down, chase tennis balls, and play fetch. And let them play for like an hour. And then put them back in their pens, and then get them fed. So... That's kind of the main chores for the dogs. Uh, I got to start planning for next winter. So I'll be rebuilding sleds, counting booties, figuring out how many booties I need for dog paws going into next winter, figuring out how many new harnesses I need to order. So essentially summer months are just taking care of dogs, feeding, scooping, watering, and then maintaining gear for the winter. I had the pleasure of being able to come up with you and it, it was you know, my job isn't manual labor anymore. I couldn't believe how brutally exhausted I was at the end of every day. And I remember when I came up there, I wanted a trip where basically if I didn't pack my bag right, I would die. And you gave that to me. And we had a, a great dog sled. It was three days in Denali. The, the night was brutally cold. The stars, there was zero light pollution. It was unbelievably beautiful. And I remember digging in the snow to put the tent up and I was sweating so much, I took my shirt off. At this night, I can't, I don't know how cold it was, well below freezing. And I just kind of stopped while you were feeding the dogs and just soaked it up. It, it was, it was like blissful. I almost couldn't believe that that was your life because it's so outside the realm of normalcy for most people. And just like you sought the teams for the hardship, you sought the Iditarod for the hardship, the ultimate challenge, the ultimate relationship with dogs. So let's, let's jump to the Iditarod. Maybe I am a glutton for misery, but the Iditarod threw everything at me that, that, that you would imagine could get thrown at you through a thousand miles of trails through the wilderness. The hardest part of Iditarod was getting to the start line. It wasn't just instant success and, and uh, there was a lot of ups and downs to get there. I guess I wanted to do the Iditarod with a team of my own dogs that I bred and chose and raised from puppies until they were adult dogs. When we first got into dog mushing, I got my first two dogs from Allie and Alan, the two people that I worked with starting out. And then through them, I met another dog musher named Sebastian Schnuli, who sold me his property. And he won the Yukon Quest and finished second in the Iditarod. And I took his dogs and Allie's dogs, Allie and Alan's dogs, and bred them. And that's what kind of created my lineage of, of dogs, my, my bloodlines. And I took those dogs and that's what became my Iditarod team. So it, it takes a lot of work and years of, of genetics and, and like breeding and thinking down the line before you actually get a team capable 
of running something like the Iditarod. So it took a lot of work. And, and when I was at the start line looking down my team, I could I saw my dogs and how excited they were to go. And I could imagine each dog when they were just tiny little puppies whenever I first got them and now seeing them full adults ready to charge down the, one of the hardest trails in the world was pretty cool to see. In order to do the Iditarod, you got to qualify for it. So you got to run two 200 mile races and one 300 mile race. And so I finished all those qualifying races. But when we started the Iditarod, it starts in Willow, just a little bit north of Anchorage. And it's, it's river miles. So you're on the frozen Yetna and Squetna rivers for, I don't know, the first 70 miles of the race. And since you're so close to Anchorage, there's little people everywhere they're handing you hot dogs and beers and and candy and sodas and stuff. So the first 100 miles of the race, you stay pretty well fed and you see quite a bit of people. But then once you get out of Squetna, you kind of lose, you kind of start getting into the remoteness of it all and it starts setting in. I had a female in heat at the start. And one thing that happens when you have a female in heat is it can create animosity between the males that normally would get along. And I had a dog fight break out right at the start. And my best lead dog got a puncture wound on his paw and then actually had to be dropped, wasn't even able to go on the race because of that. So we started off the Iditarod without my best dog, which was a huge loss. So we were going down these rivers. So to paint the rivers, they're right outside of Anchorage. So they get a lot of snowmobile or snow machine traffic on them. So there's just trails carved every way off the main trail. So I, it was hard because I lost my main lead dog to stay on the right trail. I had dogs with ADD, it seemed like, when we first started off. They're like, I'm going to go down this trail, and then I'm going to go down this trail. So it was kind of a headache until we got away from the, the heavily populated areas and got down to the single trail. And that was once we got to Squetna, which was the second checkpoint in the race. Dogs were doing good, rested, I think, four hours in Squetna, three hours in Squetna. And then we took off running. When we left Squetna, the trail got to be real rough and punchy. Really, there's about three big obstacles or mustards to think about that can be very treacherous and are known to potentially end mustards run at the Adidrod via injuries or breaking sleds. And that's the Happy River Steps, which is a series of really st- steep drops followed by real sharp 90-degree turns. And if you don't hit those perfectly, you're either going to run right into a tree or you're going to fly off into a off the, the cliff down into the, the, the river. I think there's like three or four big big drops but luckily whenever i hit the steps it was right during a huge snowstorm so the snow kind of padded the ground and really like helped us go slow through those so i didn't have to really maneuver that much through it so it was a very easy way to get introduced to the steps i didn't have any problem getting through there Uh, i guess the people that hit it first like the top of the pack had some troubles with it but had no problems up okay so then after you get to the steps you run into a checkpoint called rainy pass it's like the center of the heart of the alaskan range so the alaska range is the mountain range where denali mountain is the highest peak in north america and it's the last part before you go up and over it and so we rested in rainy pass for i think five six hours maybe got the dogs a good meal and then booted up and we took off and as soon as you leave rainy pass you start that climb going up and over the alaska range when, when you're at the checkpoint though like you're you're taking care of the dogs. So over this period of time, you're really not sleeping. Your whole focus is making sure that they're recovering and they're eating and they're healthy. And that's the checkpoint. You're not actually just taking a break and kicking your feet up. Yeah, that's that's correct. So the only one who's allowed to do anything for your dogs is the musher. The very first thing I do is I have, we have drop bags is what we call them. They're essentially resupply bags. They have dog food, meat snacks for the dogs, booties for the dogs and then any gear you might need extra gloves extra socks just batteries for headlights headlamps and stuff like that for yourself so the resupply points so whenever i get there i cut up my bags get dog food and throw dog food out for the dogs and then i go back through the lines and remove all the booties on the dogs on the dog's paws and then i go back through the dogs again and lay out straw for them because the dogs are trained whenever they see the straw it's time to lay down and sleep so i'll go out and lay down the straw to let the dogs know we're going to be here for a while lay down the straw the dogs will lay down and then i'll start cooking the dogs the real meal and we have a little dog food cooker that's like a, it's, a, it's a square and it runs off a of heat or methanol and you dump the methanol in you light it and then it has an insert and you just start shoveling snow in the insert and it'll melt the snow into water eventually that water will boil and then you'll dump that boiling water into a cooler full of 
frozen meat and dog food. And then you'll kind of make like a soup for the dogs. And that's how I feed them. So they'll get a, a warm meal. By the time I get the dogs fed, and then I'll go back through and re, uh, repack out my sled for the following run and get the booty set out for the following run and make sure everything's ready to go. I'll maybe go fall asleep. If I get an hour or two, I'm lucky. That's for like a four or five hour rest. Six hours, if I get two to three hours, I'm lucky there too. So yeah, I didn't get much sleep during the Iditarod. It's, uh, it's definitely a sleep deprivation. Actually, leaving Rainy Pass as we started climbing, I was still pretty focused because uh, the next thing coming is called the Delzell Gorge. It's a super steep drop down and in, in through this gorge that gets super rutted out. And there's trees you have to like steer the sled around. I should run right into them. And that was definitely a little bit challenging. You definitely was white knuckling that sled as you, because as you're going down, the dogs, I think I had my GPS on. I had a clock to say like 18 miles an hour going down there. Oh man. And you got to be careful because the sled can actually go faster than, than the dogs. And you run, run into the problem, potentially running over your dog. So you got to stay in control. And uh, so you're definitely like monitoring the dogs and, and trying to go as slow as possible. But white knuckled that that area and then whenever you get to the bottom of that you drop down into a frozen lake or frozen river that's been windblown so there's no real footing it's just it's like you can ice skate on it it's just like sheer ice and so you're kind of at the dog's control hopefully getting into the right spot of the of the river it's a big river maybe half a mile quarter mile across so and then once you drop down to the river I don't know, maybe another three, four miles, half hour, and then you're you're into that the checkpoint called Roan. And that was like super relieved to get there. You know, you got through the last two hard, treacherous parts of the trail and getting into Roan to kind of get your, your bearings about you again. It's kind of nice. But when you leave Roan, you have maybe two more hills to climb and then you're out of the Alaska range. And then what you're into is a, a place called the Burn. So Years ago, decades ago, wildfire went through this area and burnt down all the vegetation. And without vegetation, there's nothing for the snow to really grab a hold of. And wind will just blow all the snow out of there then. So there's little to no snow at all on the trail. So you're running down dirt road. It's literally a dirt road with boulders and, and logs and stuff on the on the trail. And you're trying to get your sled through it without breaking it. And a lot of people break their sleds in the burn. It's about 25 miles a stretch of trail that you're where you're not dealing with any snow and it's it's really hard for you to be on the sled itself so you're off running beside the sled because if you put all your weight on it there's all that friction getting put down onto the dirt trail with rocks and stuff and the sled does not uh, the sled does not glide as easy as it does on snow so with all your weight on there the dogs are pulling extra hard so a lot of times you only get like a few seconds before you're running off the side of it so i didn't even think about that part of it so you're, you're not just on the back of the sled which is exhausting enough you're actually running quite a bit during this how many days was it eight days it took me 12 days 12 days so during that 12 days maybe an hour or two of sleep here or there and you're running beside it you got to be careful too because like you catch yourself sweating you can't sweat too much because especially once you get north of the alaska range temperatures will start dropping quick because all the the warm weather from the ocean gets blocked by the the mountains there and you're left with the cold, dry air north of the mountains. So once you get north of those mountains, it gets cold quick. And if you start sweating too much, it, that can really bite you in the butt. So you got to be cognizant of how hard you're putting out and what layers you're wearing. But yeah, there's a 20 to 25 mile stretch of on the sled, off the sled running, on the sled, getting off the sled running kind of thing. And once we hit snow, both the dogs and me were super pumped once we finally got in the snow again. The stretch from Roan to Nikolai, which is the next checkpoint. And that was the first native village on the trail was about, I think it's like 70, 75 miles. I broke that up in halfway to a camp out in between. Got, gave the dogs like four hours, five hours of rest. On the way into Nikolai, that's when the sleep deprivation really started hitting. It starts getting flat once you get into the interior of Alaska and you can start running on some of these lakes. And Nikolai was maybe 10 miles away. And I started like really struggling to stay awake after putting out like that and then finally i uh, got flat and the dogs were eating up the miles quickly and i was like 10 miles has taken a lot longer than i thought it should have and i was starting to question like did i fall asleep and just miss the turn to get to to nikolai and am i on the way to the next checkpoint or somewhere that i don't even know where i'm going and eventually I, I found my way to the right place but that was what was going through my head with little to no sleep but yeah we made it to nikolai definitely 
after running through all that dirt and rocks and stuff, you have to change out the runner plastics because the, the sled gets pretty banged up. There's a little bit of sled repairs you need to do and fix the sled up. The dogs got six hours of rest. I think I got two hours of rest there and then went on to the next checkpoint was McGrath. We stayed two hours there and then bounced to, to Katna, which was where I did my 24 hour rest. It, each, each musher is required to give their team one 24 hour rest somewhere on the trail. And I did it right at the 350 mile mark. I just set my alarm for every six hours. I would get up and feed the dogs for 24 and tried to get four big meals in them and they devoured their food, ate great. And they bounced back and were ready to to hit the trail again within 24 hours. And we were putting really fast times down. And the next checkpoint was Ofer, which is only like 18 miles away. We got there real quick. Once you get past Ofer, you're in the middle of nowhere now. Like you're, you're like, there's nothing for 75 plus miles, like no one. It's barren, remote. It's about as remote as you can get in the world. And you kind of feel that going through that. The next checkpoint was Cripple. I stayed maybe five, six hours in Cripple and then off to the Ruby, which was the first village on the Yukon River. And then that's whenever like, it started hitting me like, man, I just ran a dog team from Anchorage the whole way to the Yukon River. And it was like, wow, that's, that's why it was like five. We were already 500 miles into the, the journey at that point. The most technical part of the trail was behind us. The burn was behind us. The steps, the gorge all was behind us. Now it's the Yukon River and rivers are flat. So in my head like, ah, this is gonna, probably going to be pretty easy traveling now. No more hills, just flat river traveling. And I was, I was wrong. When, when I hit the river, that's whenever we started getting into the real cold, cold weather. So the first night on the Yukon River, it got down to 35 to 40 below zero. We left Ruby. The next checkpoint was Galena. And then we were hit Galena. We were there during the day. I left Galena in the middle of the afternoon. And it was like a beautiful day, zero degrees. Sun was out. It was like the perfect day to run dogs. Beautiful trail. Got into the lotto, which was the next checkpoint. And it was nighttime. It started getting cold as we were getting into the lotto. When we left the lotto, the temperature was 45 below zero down on the on the river and winds were picking up and we were facing a 25 mile an hour wind. And I remember getting to that point. And when it gets that cold, the snow turns into like sand, like all the, the snow crystals like fall apart, like they don't pack together, they fall apart. They're so cool. There's nothing for them to like pack into. So traveling like on the the sleds runners, it just not, not doesn't glide right. And there's nothing you can really do about it when it's that cold. You just it's just a harder pull. And when you drop down, there's one spot specifically where the you drop down into the river and it really opens up to a really wide section. And I mean, it's like a mile, mile and a half long. It's a huge river wide and we hit this section and it it got drastically colder like as soon as we got in this wide spot it just you could feel it It got cold the sled started going slower and the winds picked up and the dogs turned around and started looking at me like what the heck where the heck are we and i was like because the next guy behind me was eight to twelve hours behind me slightest thing that could happen out there man could cause a big injury so you're staying focused on the dogs focus on what's in front of you no matter how tired how cold it is because you're, you're the natural thing is you got your hood up and you have this big fur rough over your face and you're kind of want to huddle down, especially when the winds are blowing. But you got to still pay attention to the dog. So as a musher, you're monitoring the dog's gates, the lines. Because if you turn around and, and lose sight of things, the dogs can get tangled up and all sorts of stuff. So you're you're constantly forced to pay attention to all that. The other thing is the dogs read off your energy. So if the dogs sense you being a little bitch on the back of the sled, they're going to feed off that. So got to like have, find that false motivation which i started doing that from buds man <laughs> find that fa- false positive motivation and start spreading that through the team and before we knew it we were out off the river and as soon as we got off the river it felt like temperatures increased by like 10 15 degrees and once we got off the river there's i think total river travel we had 250 250 miles of river travel there and once we got off the river man the dogs were super happy our speeds increase. Yeah, just the overall vibe of the team was so much better. That put us into Caltag, and which is the last village along the, the Yukon River. And I stayed there for six hours. Then it was an overland trail all the way up until a village called Unicleet, which put us onto the Bering Sea. 
And when I hit the, the Bering Sea, that's whenever it was like very, very like surreal. Like, wow, we just ran our dogs from Nome all the way up to the, the Bering Sea. Now we're running on sea ice. At that point of running that far, if something happens metabolically to the dogs where they like find the sixth gear, they're eating everything you throw in front of them. They be, essentially become like almost like indestructible, like machines almost. They're, they'll, they want to run. They kind of know what's going on. They eat everything you throw at them. They're excited to go. Their attitudes are happy. Uh, they kind of understand what's going on now. So from Unicle all the way up into White Mountain, which is the last checkpoint of the, the race, we were like the top six teams putting up the fastest runs from checkpoint to checkpoint. So our do- the dogs are flying. They were doing great. The weird thing is when you hit the, the Bering Sea, when you're running on the sea ice, it can be mentally taxing for humans and dogs because it's just white everywhere, especially you cloud cover. Everywhere you look is white. You have nothing to go off as far as scenery. It's kind of weird because once you get out in the middle, you look left to right, there's no hills, there's no mountain. It's just flat. Kind of like being out there in the middle of the Zodiac, you know, imagine it all being frozen. And there's snow everywhere. So it's like, it's just kind of like a mental games, you know, like when's this going to end? There's one, one tr- section of the trail where you leave and it's a 50 mile run straight through the sea ice. So you're running 50 miles with no scenery changing. It's like being on a treadmill for 50 miles where you don't, aren't looking at anything. And the dogs can get really bored with that. So I did that section of trail with a buddy of mine. Laura Eklund, and we just kept like ping ponging off each other. I'd pass him, he'd pass me, and just to keep our dogs mentally engaged. And and that's kind of how we tackled that section together. And once we hit White Mountain, it's a mandatory eight hour rest. The dogs got eight hours of rest. And whenever I went to get them to go, we got them up and started taking off, and we were flying. And this is like, okay, we're almost done. Like we got, I think, 75 miles to the finish, but you have to go up and over these these hills called the Topcock Mountains. And started going up and over them. And I think there's seven climbs you have to do. And I was going up like the climb number four or five. And there's one real steep part. And my sled got off to the left side of it and got like wedged in between the steep part. And it slammed into the dog's heart. That's kind of like abruptly stopped the team. And the female that I still had that was in heat was one up from another dog. And it created like a slinky effect in the line. And... He, the dog caught wind, dog, the dogs, the males caught wind of the female and heat essentially mm. what happened. And they turned around, all the dogs turned around to try to breed the female, kind of created a cluster. And it took me a while to untangle that situation. But when I did, the males no longer wanted to run. They just wanted to turn around and breed the female. And I was 25 miles from the checkpoint and from checkpoint behind me and, and 23 miles of the checkpoint in front of me. So I sat there for a while trying to figure out how to get the dogs to go and they wouldn't go forward. So what I did is I ended up hooking up a leash to the front of the team. I just walked the teams up the hill. It was probably another 10 miles until we got to the last hill and dropped down into the sea ice and we were back on the sea ice again. And once we got back into the sea ice, the dogs started running again and got us into the checkpoint called safety. Normally mushers blow through that. They don't stop there because it's only 22 miles to the finish line then. And That's like nothing for sled dogs. Like that's a walk in the park. So we get to safety and the dogs, they see the checkpoint. And I hadn't missed a checkpoint. At this point, I went to every single checkpoint and the dogs are used to seeing the straw and the drip bags and going there and resting for six hours. And they didn't want to go past it. And I was like, well, I guess if you guys don't want to go, we can't go. And that's the one misconception is the dogs, there's nothing I can do as a human to make the dogs want to go. If they don't want to run, they just don't run. So like, as I did ride, the dogs aren't forced to do anything they don't want to do. So we hit that checkpoint and the dogs were like, nope, we're not going any further. I was like, you know what? I haven't slept in a long time. So I'm going to go get like two hours of sleep and come back and rethink this thing through. So went, passed out, woke up two hours later. And I was like, you know what? Enough nice guy. I'm telling the guy, the dogs that they're, they don't have a choice anymore. We're going. So I went out there with a completely different energy. I went out there as more of like a, a stern, like, hey, we're, we're going. Like, get ready. We're moving. We're moving down the trail. I don't care if it's at a walk pace. Like, we're just traveling 22 miles. Like, that's it. And then you guys can be done. And if I have to walk in front of you the whole way, that's what we'll do. So I hooked the dogs up with that, that type of energy I was putting out towards them. And as soon as I said, let's go, they took off running down the trail. Like, they, they figured it out. There's one last hill we climbed, Cape Nome. And as soon as we got up on top of Cape Nome, 
they saw the lights and gnome like oh there's the next checkpoint and they started taking off 10 miles an hour again and we ended up going across the finish line how satisfying was it how much weight did you lose what what was the what was the feeling so the last i'd say 80 miles of the race i bet you i walked 20 to 25 of those miles with the dogs when i came across the finish line i actually sweated through all my base layers two layer two puffy layers and my parka by the end, by, by the time I got to Nome, I started taking off layers. My parka was freezing from my sweat. It was putting out that much when I got there. So not only did, did I lose a bunch of weight, but 12 hours on the trail sweating like that, man, you can imagine how bad I smelled. Yeah. A mixture of BO, dog meat, <laughs> fish. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was a combination of odors for sure when I finished. I finished, I think I weighed 155, which I haven't weighed that much since... I was like a sophomore in high school. Oh my God. 155. Yeah. What'd you start at? You were 170 or so? Yeah, I was about 170, 165, 170. That's incredible. That's incredible. A year's worth of work that was put out. That, that was that's incredible. Are you going to do it again? It's hard to answer. I don't think I'll end up doing it again. Uh, in order for me to, to do it, I would have to get another four to five dogs just based on ages of the dogs that I have. So you every year dogs age out and you have dogs retire. I, I have two to three dogs that are retiring. So who knows, man, everyone does the, I did rod for their own unique reasons. Mine was never about winning or finishing in the top. It was about creating that bond with, with my dogs. And I definitely, definitely did that. So I don't really know. There's plenty of adventures to get around here. You know, like what we did up in, and in, in Denali, like I, I think I have more fun doing that, you know, with, group of buddies and going out camping out doing some running with the dogs and traveling through remote areas and camping and maybe mixing in a little hunting a little fishing on the what's that i want to hit on like two things one is the relationship with the dogs because that is fascinating and two is the, like the mental dialogue that got you through that but the relationship with the dogs like you're not talking gasoline and motors you're talking living breathing dogs that love and they think and they breathe and they have their own desires too how, how did you lead them through like the ultimate test of a relationship with man and dog. But what, how, how do you actually do that and build that that sort of trust? I think it starts from from day one of training. So we start training usually September 1st whenever we are training for something like the Iditarod. And the very first run that we do is three miles. And it's easy. The dogs are like, oh, that was fun. That was easy. And then we slowly incrementally build up from that. And we do put dogs through different different challenging events, whether it's a race leading up to this. So before doing the Iditarod, we did a 200 mile race leading up to it. And what we try to do with the dogs is put them through, through things that are difficult, but showing them that we're never going to ask them to do something that they cannot do. And if you do, if you do that, if th that's how you build the trust is by doing that. But if you put them, push them too hard and put them through something that they can't do and they end up quitting on you, that's hard to come back from from that. So you you really got to really the test of the bond is doing something through like the Iditarod and knowing the knowing that the dogs know that you're not going to ask them to do too much because then they're never going to quit on you, essentially. So you mentioned at one point in the race, they kind of looked back at you and like they were looking for guidance. Like, is this right? Are we, are we doing the right thing here? When we hit that 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 steep hill, they they stopped and looked back at me. And I I could tell at that point that they were starting to like it was like, man, is this going to go on forever? Like I, I understood my dog. I know my dogs well enough that I can pick up on their body languages pretty well. And that was what they were kind of like, man, is this, we're doing another one or this, is this going on forever? And then when I, whenever they found like, that was whenever I realized that, okay, like they may not be willing to keep running as hard as what we've been running. So I'll just walk with them, man. I'll show them that I'm like, I got their back. Are the dogs looking to see, are you willing to suffer alongside them too? Not just tell them what to do, but they want to see you actually suffer right there. Yeah. And like, it, it was very apparently every hill we hit, if I wasn't, they'd, they'd look back. And if I wasn't off the sled, they would be like, mm -mm, <laughs> get off, buddy. <laughs> 22 miles from Nome. There's one last hill that you have to climb and it's just big enough to where it's annoying. And you're on flat sea ice before getting up there and the dogs are doing good. And I couldn't actually, they didn't want me on the, the sled completely. So I had to be on one side of the runners and kind of using my foot like a skateboard and, and kicking that way to help push the sled around. 
And we hit the the last hill and the dog stopped, turned around, waited for me to get off before going up the, 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 the hill. Yeah. What, what was your, what was your head track like throughout this thing? Was it just a running stream of, you know, I could do this. This sucks. Were there songs playing in your head? Were you thinking about your family? What was it that literally got you through the hardest moments of the Iditarod? Whenever I noticed the dogs would be hitting like a low point or a difficult section of the trail, or maybe it was something that I was perceiving as difficult and putting off on the dogs and thinking that they thought it was difficult, but it was really me thinking it was difficult. I would start like singing or acting like it wasn't that big of a deal in the back of the sled. Sometimes I would get up and like try to run up to the, the, the dogs close to the sled and pet them real quick and run back to the sled, <laughs> especially if I was starting to fall asleep or get tired. I didn't have any music playing during the, the entire time. I guess after mile 200, because I realized when I had my headphones in and was listening to music, I was, it took away from me being in tune with the dogs. I wanted to hear every sneeze, every cough, every wheeze, everything that was going on with the dog. I wanted to be able to hear. The cool thing about the whole experience, man, of the Iditarod is man and beast become one freaking machine during, like, towards the end of that race is like, you're one unit, man. You, you just like a SEAL platoon where like, you know, the how each individual that that platoon works same thing with a musher and their dogs like they know what the likes the dislikes of the dogs where they excel where they don't excel you know like certain dogs hate certain environments some dogs hate the sea ice some dogs love the sea ice some dogs hate the yukon river some dogs like the yukon river some dogs hate running on hills some dogs like hills like it's all different different for different dogs and you learn all that during that that whole experience and you become like one unit you tell you can tell when one dog when one individual dog is a little bit off and one dog is is hitting hard and is firing all cylinders and you just pick up on all that it's incredible last question part of the theme of the podcast is how do you basically trial and error and iterate your way to becoming optimal you're at the absolute pinnacle of the craft of dog mushing so your your routines are quite a bit different from what we'd probably see in the business world or in the military world. What are, let's say, one or two or three or four things you do every day that are kind of like a ritual that get you to operate at that level that set your mind in the right spot? It could be a spiritual thing. It could be a physical thing. How do you get yourself primed for each day to get ready for that kick in the nuts? I do a lot of meditation, man. That's uh, a good, like the mornings I start off, I, I do a meditation. It helps kind of me stay focused on what needs to happen in the day prioritize the day's events too. What does and the meditation I, look like? I do an app. It's called Balance. I do a, whatever they kind of pick for me on the balance, I'll do one of those. And then I'll do a gratitude meditation after that to, you know, just, it's always good to express gratitude. And then after that, I'll do a kind of binaural beats, put that headphones in with that and kind of let my mind go where it goes. And, and then turn off the noise and kind of just be with, with my, internal dialogue i guess or be with myself that helps me being uh, come out of that just feeling good you know in the right headspace and ready to tackle the day's events then i head outside and in out with the dogs and it's, it's hard to be down when you're surrounded by that much positive energy so it's that's kind of like the cheat sheet man get, get yourself 25 dogs and it's hard to be down <laughs> all right brother i appreciate it man thanks absolutely buddy good chat with you that's it for this episode. If you want to check out more from the podcast, head to zeroeyes.com slash nobel, where you can see show notes, read more about our guests, and suggest guests or topics of your own. Until next time, stay in the fight. Don't ring the bell.